Welcome to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm Tina Olson, Director of the University of Michigan Museum of Art. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome artist Jaime Plenza, whose sculpture, Behind the Walls, was recently installed outside the front doors of OMA. Behind the Walls is a 24 and a half foot figure of a teenage girl who shields herself from the outside world by covering her eyes with her hands. Previously installed at Rockefeller Plaza in New York City, the work is part of an ongoing series in which the artist monumentalizes the likenesses of young women in public spaces. The protective gesture seen in this particular sculpture speaks to the weight that societal turbulence and uncertainty places upon an individual. It's, a, it's in celebration of her arrival that we present to you tonight's program. The following conversation between Mr. Plenza, myself, and University of Michigan students took place on February 5th. Now let's join the conversation. Jama, I'm really excited to talk today and so grateful to you for the time um, and just for the opportunity to understand better um, behind the walls and your work and career. Um, I very much wish we were talking in person. Um, I, I'm hopeful that we will have that chance in the future and we'll be able to welcome you to Michigan and Ann Arbor. And you can see in, with your own eyes um, how, how well behind the walls. Um, is being taken care of um, in Ann Arbor. So I'd like to, to start us off by talking about portraiture. Um, you have been making monumental heads and large scale figures for decades now, and at least until the Millennium Park Commission. And you've described them many times as portraits and also, as you just mentioned earlier today, as messages and bottles. So I would like it, I would be, grateful if you would talk a little bit about the ways in which um, the works are portraits and to push you a little bit on this question of um, message in a bottle, what the message is and um, who it's from. Well, actually, as you mentioned, uh, thanks to the project in Chicago, the Crown Fountain, in where I decided to film 1000 portraits of people living in town to really talk about the, 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 the true or the main soul of one city uh, in front of architecture is people. Okay, I, I wanted to, to take the, the largest mosaic as possible in terms of people and, and it was all kind of edges, uh, origins, uh, well, everything as possible, and, but it was filmed in video. Uh, when I finished that experience, I, I thought it was great and I wanted to keep on the track of portraits, but with more classical materials. Okay, in that moment, well, the idea of message and bottle was much clearer for me because it seems that I was creating containers uh, to, to, to let this, something inside traveling all around. Uh, since always, I thought that the head is probably the most important part of our body, probably the wildest part of our body. Our brain in the darkness of the head is it's uh, crossing messages from all over. And also if two ideas wants to meet, even if you are not happy, they meet it. And that's something it could be fantastic or not, but the ideal was to try to really use the portraits as, I don't know, uh, let's say uh, as an icon of humanity. When you see one, one face, could be any one of us represented there. It's not exactly the idea of a journalist taking portraits. It's more the idea to, to, to think about humanity thanks to single people, people that are anonymous, but they're taking so an incredible importance just because they exist. And that is the, for me, the idea of message. The message is the message of each of us in front of that portrait. So there are portraits of people, individual people. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about, about that process of your making them, but they're also representative. So they're kind of doing two, two jobs at once. But could you say some, a little bit more about um, about how they're made in terms of the, um, the likeness to an individual person? Well, uh, in, in, in the Crown Fountain, it was all kind of people. But uh, when I decided to keep on that idea of portraits, I decided only to do 
uh, uh, female portraits uh, only in that case young woman the, the woman when is changing from a kid into a, a woman this is a strange time in where beauty is very ephemeral this uh, this moment in everything is changing so quickly why because i always thought that memory is female and future is female i always consider that uh, boys, uh, male, as me, are uh, a fantastic accident, but just an accident. The real, real chain of society are always the woman, the female idea, which is uh, uh, permanently there. Uh, I guess for us, the life is a little bit more an accident. And, and well, I kept that track and, and now I have probably 40 or 50 portraits since 2005 that I started more or less to, to do it. And, uh, and, and it's crazy because they, they have something in common, which is uh, that they are not anymore existing. When, when you take, uh, as you know, I'm scanning the head. It's not exactly a photography, it's a scanning. Uh, when I took the volume of that head in my computer, uh, uh, the person from who I, did that portrait does not exist anymore. It disappeared. Two seconds after, it does not exist anymore. And, and it's the memory of something that could represent all of us. And that is finally the, the source of my work or, or the main subject, to try to talk about all of us, thanks to the shape or the form of somebody specific. Something mm -hmm. that was always in parallel, which is photography and sculpture. Mm -hmm. Photography, which is something trying to catch the most ephemeral things of our society. This, uh, this, this, uh, this is a strange perfume that society is spreading all around. And merging that with a sculptor, which normally is pretending to talk about eternity. And it's funny, this contradiction in my work, which is merging, merging photography and sculpture, the most ephemeral and the most eternal things. I like that observation of sculpture, pretending to talk about what's timeless. Um, and I wondered if we could just segue a little bit back to this question of representing women um, and this idea of the future being female, because despite, despite the fact or, or your notion of the future being female, there isn't a lot of large scale monumental um, representations of women in the history of art, mostly when you see them, they're not portraits, they're allegories like virtue or beauty. And so I wondered if that context is important for your work, if partly what you were seeking to address is that gap that we see, mostly we see men on horsebacks and we see generals and we see kings and we don't see a lot of women. Yeah, I think it's very important because I still remember Many years ago, I've been invited to do a, a public project in Salzburg, in Austria. And I don't know if you know Salzburg, but it's a beautiful city, plenty of big statues of, uh, of uh, very important men, let's say, no? artist shops uh, and, 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 and counts and people like that. And I decided to do one of my portraits because as you know, I, I'm also working with this kind of human figures made out with alphabets and things like that. But in that case, I wanted to do absolutely the portrait of a, a young girl, especially a girl coming from Dominican Republic, uh, emigrate to Spain. And, and, and I guess I, and, and I did a very big piece, which is now in front of the university in Salzburg, but is the portrait of this young girl coming from Dominican Republic, living in Spain. And I guess it was a contradiction, a kind of shock because she was, she is still there, surrounded by very important men. No? Uh, I don't know, it's a, a, an ironic comment, obviously. Uh, I did the same, for example, in Rio de Janeiro, when I installed another head of a woman inside the water, right in front of the sugar low, in front of the Corcobado, the Christ in the other side of the city. And, and, and I guess it's also the celebration of this female attitude. I guess it's important uh, that the wall is needed. And, and, and I'm, I'm, as a man, I'm always trying to celebrate the female aspects of humanity. 
it's not necessarily only women, some uh, man also has that. Uh, it's, it's an attitude with life. And, and, and I guess uh, I'm celebrating that since years, actually. Those sculptures of man, you know, when we see a man on a horseback or we see a general, um, seem to be about kind of reverence, like you are down below and you're looking up and there's a certain kind of, um, of um, quality from the viewer that is expected and that is kind of an adulation or reverence. And your work doesn't seem to be, doesn't seem to be asking that from a viewer. So I wonder if you could say more about um, the kind of attention you, your, your sculptures um, ask for or invite. I'd, I'd love to hear, hear your well, thoughts on that. I think it's very interesting because actually the piece that you have in the museum, in your museum, it's probably uh, very radical in the way that the hands are covered in her eyes, but in general, all my portraits has the eyes closed in a kind of dream state attitude. Uh, I, I'm always do the portraits with the eye closed because I'm asking the, the viewer, the guy which will stop in front of the piece, uh, to use my piece as a mirror in, in some ways, uh, because people are asking themselves, why she has the eyes closed, surrounded by so interesting things, or, or for this amazing landscape, or whatever, in a city, in in in, in the landscape, whatever. And and my 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 response is always that we are hidden so much information and beauty inside ourselves that I guess the importance many times is not the exterior part of our container, it's the interior, what we are keeping inside that extraordinary container that we can call our body. And, and, and if, with the eyes closed, finally, uh, it, it, the, 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 the portrait becomes a question for the viewer in the way that uh, what you have inside yourself, what you can share with me that for culture or for education, you never feel is the right moment to talk about it. And, and I guess it's very important. Uh, I don't know, I have incredible experiences uh, when, when I finished to install a piece in an incredible landscape, the people said, but why she has the eyes closed surrounded with so much beauty? I said, but come on guys, the, you know how much beauty she is keeping inside herself. Let's try to discover all these secret landscapes, this secret garden that probably all of us has keeping, has hidden inside ourselves. That's very, very beautiful. The idea of um, um, of the ways in which the closed eyes um, kind of jolts people into a a different kind of consciousness of their own interior life. Yeah. Um, I want to turn toward a different topic. Um, and it has to do with uh, very large um, debates that are going on in the United States and in Europe and elsewhere um, about monuments and in particular Confederate monuments. And I'm sure you know um, that there are hundreds of such monuments here in the United States, and uh, a number of them have been removed from public spaces. Um, there is also a lot of attention, um, new attention, to um, who is represented um, in, in large-scale public sculpture and who is not. And we, we just kind of were talking about that a little bit in terms of women, but it's also very much a conversation in terms of race and people of color. So I wondered if you could um, talk with us a little bit about how you understand your own work, um, figural work in terms of these issues around uh, monumental work and around representation. Um, so yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, a portrait of people from different countries or different cultures or different races or different colors, as you said, it's part of my work. Uh, in the Crown Fountain is clear because it was a video and you can completely recognize the person in its origin and, and color and race, etc. In the sculpture, many times uh, it's a little bit different because if I'm using the portrait of a Chinese uh, woman 
or an Afro-American woman or South American woman. I don't know. But I'm carving the piece in white marble. It seems that all those people are white. Or if it's, I'm, I'm carving the piece in black granite from India, it seems that everybody has that color. I mean, I guess the beauty of the sculpture is that it's cleaning completely the details. You only keep the sense of humanity, the, the soul of that person. I, I love uh, to work with alabaster, with marble, with wood, with glass, with all number of materials that allow me to talk about the soul of the person without any uh, detail, let's say. I know many times details are very important, of course, but I guess the soul as well. And, and my sculpture, in many ways, in this kind of portraits, are trying to do that relationship with the viewer. Uh, and, 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 and normally, I'm, I'm using a direct material uh, and colors. In the case of the piece in, in Michigan, it's a, it's a fiberglass and resin with marble dust. And the color is white because the, the, the final gel coat white is mixed it up with this marble dust and it's creating this special white surface that looks a little bit like snow, this color. Uh, and, 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 and that is the, 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 the reason that the piece is white, not because the, the, the portrait is about a, a, a white woman. I'm very struck by that idea of a poetic shelter and also by this notion of a kind of um, counter to geometry. Um, and I wonder whether that has something that's part of what the, why scale is so important in your work, why this work is so monumental, because it has to stand up against large scale structures and, lar and, and, a, and, a, and the environment. In a, and it has to have a kind of potency um, for that private relationship that you describe um, that I think you achieve. I mean, I, I can tell you from um, behind the walls um, in Ann Arbor that um, I rarely go by without seeing people in front of, uh, in front of her, um, approaching her, sitting on the pedestal. So there's, there is the, the energy that you describe is really palpable. It's really, evident. Um, and I wanted to shift um, a little bit to, to back to your point about the hands over the eyes, because it, it is true that, 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 there, that most of your work has closed eyes. And then there are some examples that have like the finger to the mouth, like a closed mouth or a covered mouth. And this is different. Um, and many people have interpreted it. I've heard this from students as a kind of, I don't want to know uh, what's happening in the world, that the world is so um, distressed right now. There's so much turbulence in the world that, that I don't want to see it. So I wondered if you could talk about that decision you made with, with Behind the Walls to have her cover uh, her eyes that way. Say more about that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very interesting because uh, my first intention was to try to make, a, let's say, a kind of metaphor about the walls all around the world. Uh, people, or many, many politicians are upset to create walls in between countries, in between communities, in between societies, to split families or, 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 or I don't know what. Uh, but many times I'm, I feel guilty or, or part of the problem because probably we can do more than we are doing. We are thinking that they are only politicians to responsible, but we probably don't do as much as we can probably do it. And, and I felt that it's a, a very clear image that we can cover with our hands, our eyes, to don't see the reality around us. And it connects pretty strongly with this idea of the wise monkeys. You probably know from the Japanese tradition, the three monkeys with, with, uh, with this Concept see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil, this idea, this and this, but in a completely different way as well, because I also think that 
many times eyes are not the best way to look at something or your mouth are not the best way to talk about something or your ears are not the best to listen something i guess we are we have other parts on our of our body that we are never using in this idea of vibrations of energy things like that to exchange with the rest of the world to breathe more than to say to breathe more than to try to look at you know to try to get the rhythm of energy and life okay uh, it's true that we are in a very strange time in 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 in, in politics, in, in economy, with the pandemia, with health as well. I mean, and, and, and it's, a, it's an extra problem for, for the world today, I know. But art should survive. Art should try to be, go a little bit farther. And, and honestly, I'm still positive and plenty of hope about our community and our society. And, uh, when you send me that amazing rendering of the piece uh, besides the door, I thought it was exactly the right place for me. Not inside, not exactly outside, just in one side of the door, which I think it's perfect because mm -hmm. people could walk through and by and just think a little bit about what we can do more for our society, for our, uh, I don't know, uh, relative, for our friends, for our, I don't know. I mean, we have a tremendous responsibility today, not only for, as artists, but as people living in a complex society. Well, it also strikes me that there are, there are some aspects to being on the campus that seem very in tune with your desires for your work. For, in, for example, that there are so many adolescents who are in this moment that you've described in terms of your own work of change, that they're emerging as people and thinkers, and um, and that that's a kind of a, that's a kind of opportunity that the that the campus offers that is that that other sites don't to the same degree. And I guess that it's the interesting part of one university. I, I guess the, the the piece that I install at the Getty University in Frankfurt is call it. Uh, house of knowledge and mm. that concept because I guess the university is a huge house of knowledge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which direction that is different because any direction is positive even the mistakes are important mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and but the house of knowledge that is my incredible respect for universities I love um, the strong connection to poetry and language in your work there's and, and, I, and, I, and this idea of a house, a container, I mean, again and again, you talk about con your work as a container and um, you're right, that is what, I mean, museums are those too, right? Museums and universities are their own containers for ideas and knowledge. And yeah. so there's a equivalence there. Um, I think that there is there, there's a there's something that we talked about when we were preparing for this talk that I want to return to, um, and that is this kind of changing ideas about public space. And you made the observation. You said, "Well, you know, um, there is a new kind of public space, and it's it's online. It's the internet, um, and that your work." Um, ends up having this other kind of life online because people are always Instagramming and taking pictures and sharing them and putting them on Facebook and Instagram. And that, I see that all the time in, in, with Behind the Walls as well. She's very, very popular um, on Instagram. So I wondered if you could, if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, if there are ways in which you think that really fundamentally changes how people experience your work, um, if there are ways in which it has changed your practice, that you are making work differently because of this new form of, of public, public life, public space. Talk to us about, about that. It's very interesting because I guess it was Octavio Paz, a Mexican poet, who said that the evolution of ideas is the wrong way to read tradition. Okay, and, and I guess Instagram is helping so much that way, the wrong way to read tradition. Why? Because they are filling up all, 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 
all the the potential places in where we can visit one site with images, 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 information, information, that it's a saturation uh, that we don't have any capacity to really think about it. In the other hand, it's also an incredible way to spread ideas all around and to send ideas to places where probably people had not the capacity to access to that place. I guess it's this kind of a strange contradiction uh, danger and an and, and, and incredible service to society. Okay, I guess since the beginning of my career when I started to work, I remember in Japan or in places like that far away of my country, I, I remember that, uh, I don't know, everything was two, three weeks, one month, two months late arriving as a news, uh, or, or what about I did in that case, but uh, Okay, the more and more, uh, two seconds after I finish one installation, the piece is all over the wall already. That, that is also extraordinary because you understand that it's not any more local place for installations. You are always working in the wall. Uh, and, and I think that is an incredible responsibility because that's a matter where you are installing one piece. The piece is part of everyone. And everywhere, no boundaries, no 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 flags, no languages. No, I think it's amazing. Conceptually, it's amazing. Uh, how the people are using all this information? That it's something that maybe we can discuss one day. In the way that it's it's a, it's a contradiction. But in terms of concept of public space, it's amazing. You probably remember that I mentioned many times that for me the the most important public space is the water, water, uh, the oceans, the sea, this kind of water that is moving permanently, that is never at the same place, that today is in one port and tomorrow in another, is uh, blazing one country and the day after in another. I think water is the, the, the great, the great link for all of us. And every time for me is possible, I'm trying to install a piece in front of the sea or in front of the ocean or inside the water. Because I guess it's a tremendous metaphor about that, that concept of public space. I guess it's two fantastic public space, internet and water. Yeah, you, you, I mean, water comes up again and again uh, when you talk about your work. I mean, even message in a bottle is a water metaphor. And when That's you described earlier your swimming, that you think about swimming in dark water and then putting your head up. That's very evocative. That's a, in just in that description, I could picture a lot about how you think yeah. about the work. Yeah, it's probably funny because it's because I, I, I could not swim. I don't float. And that it's maybe that it's, I, I did with water a certain fantasy. I only floating at the Dead Sea in where I was the happiest man in the world because I've, I've been swimming as a fish over there. So a fantasy and a dream, and you've mentioned dreams several times. Um, and one of the other ideas of, of you know, the, the hands is that she's dreaming. So I, I, I wonder if you have um, advice that you would share with the students um, about dreaming of the future um, and what your work or what these what 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 behind the walls and are dreaming dreaming yeah yeah well I, I, I still remember when I was teaching once in Paris uh, I remember I, I try to, to talk about that problem with them because I know when we have a certain age, we, we love to think about future. Um, and, and I guess the most important in my point, from my point of view is to trust on themselves. I guess uh, one of the most extraordinary qualities of human beings is that you can be right and the rest of the world wrong. I think that it's something that I think is very important first. And second, to try to find your sea where you can swim, 
because I spent many years in my life until I don't find my right sea, my right ocean. And, uh, and that those two things are very important. To trust on you, that is key. And second, to swim in the right ocean. Uh, thank you, Tina, because you, you, you did something extraordinary because you, you not only installed one sculptor, but you also try to, to dialogue with the people which are using the piece, which is the students in the university and potential visitors and the artists. That I think is terrific. It happens not so often in the way that normally uh, you, you install one piece, but you never had the possibility to talk with the people that really are using the piece or, or you know. And I think a tremendous experience for me as well, because, well, uh, I mean, it's always complicated for a visual artist to talk about the work, because that is the reason I'm making visual things, because <laughs> it's hard for me to explain myself why I'm doing that. Jama, thank you. We have some students here with us today, and I'd like to invite them to talk with us on camera and ask some questions. And I'd like to begin uh, with Angie Zhang. Angie. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Mr. Plenza, for being here with all of us today. I think I speak for everyone when I say that we really enjoyed watching your documentary. And it's especially exciting for me because I am a concert pianist and forte pianist. And I used to live in New York. I trained at the Juilliard School for 13 years. And so it was really amazing for me to be able to see behind the walls every time I walked by Rockefeller Center. And then now I live on State Street, uh, basically less than a, a minute away from behind the walls. So it really feels like full circle and it's amazing to be able to see it from my, my room window. And so my question for you today has to do with scope. It was really insightful to hear what you said in your documentary about it. And I was wondering, if you could speak more about it uh, in terms of if you think there is any difference in terms of scope and the uh, setting in uh, both Rockefeller and here with Uma behind behind the walls now. And just uh, if, if you think there are any differences, uh, I think it works really, really well in both settings. And it's been really interesting to see the different um, different ways people engage with behind the walls uh, in both so thank you so much. Hi, Angie. Thank you for your question. Well, actually, the piece has been conceived, it's funny, to be displayed in, in Venice in the beginning. But for some reasons, Paul Gray called me one day and said, Jaume, it's the possibility, uh, thanks to the Art Fair Freeze in New York, to install the piece at the Rockefeller Center. And for some reasons, we sent the piece over there and they installed the piece at, at Fifth Avenue, which was amazing. Then the piece was traveling to Mexico City, to the Munau, which is the National Museum in Mexico. And finally, it was the beautiful surprise that the museum at the University of Michigan took the piece for the, to, to be installed in the entrance. You are asking about something which is incredibly important, which is the problem of a scale in a sculpture. When we talk about the sculpture, it's always funny to say that it's three main things in a sculpture, a scale, a scale, a scale. But not necessary for me in terms of physical uh, size or volume or, or weight. I guess the scale of a piece is also related to the energy that the piece is spraying all around. I get that piece is very special because it has a certain narrative in, inside itself in the way that the hands are covering the eyes, and it's creating a certain strange private interior space to share with the public, with the audience visiting the piece. And doesn't matter if that piece is near huge buildings like in New York, or more uh, private or smaller scale, more human scale like in the university. I guess that piece has a different relationship with people, not in terms of size, but in terms of energy. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite Emily Considine to ask uh, her question. Hey, and thank you so much for being here and speaking with us. Um, my question is about one of the comments 
given by one of the commentators in the documentary who remarked that most people who see your work don't need to study or know any background information about it in order to connect with it and fully appreciate your artwork. And I'm wondering, um, because this was not you who said this, if you agree with that sentiment um, and if you ever worry about people misinterpreting your work or giving meaning to it in a way where there is none or not noticing certain details that you've included or anything like that. Hi, Emily, hello. I guess it's a very interesting question because when I'm installing one sculpture, one project, let's say, in the public fields, you have not a context that are protecting you in the terms of, because it's a museum, because it's a gallery, for sure you will see a piece of art. Not at all. In the public space, you have not any context to, to help you in that way. You have to survive by itself, by yourself. The piece is alone. And I love that situation because it's pretty wild in the way that every people walking in front has a different attitude, a different way to read the piece. And I think it's beautiful because I always thought that art should send messages as often as possible. Obviously, when I'm talking about my work, I'm talking in certain ideas, but it's also an interpretation. Probably you have a different idea than mine in front of my piece, because I guess art is based in a certain kind of intuition. And, and a terrific person as Einstein, Einstein was saying intuition is much more important than knowledge. And I completely agree with him. And I guess in art, this, this uh, way to approach one piece by emotion, it's very important. I never ask the people in front of my piece what they think about it. Uh, sometimes I ask, but it's more to be fun or to, 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 to create a certain conversation, but the importance is not really the, the, the explanation. The importance is the question. The importance is the response, the emotional response in front of the piece. And, um, and, and, and I'm very happy uh, that people has not any kind of, let's say, knowledge before to be in front of one of my pieces. I'd, I'd like to now invite um, Kirlala to ask uh, her question. Hi, Mr. Palenza. Um, you no, know, once again, thank you for being here. Um, and so I'm currently an architecture student and in my classes, we discuss about how ideas and ideals of humanity show up and how we design the world around us including art objects as well as technology and machines. Um, so I'm interested in the tension between our increasing attention to machines and automation and what that means about what we aspire to for humanity. Uh, I wonder whether it makes us less human to be so intertwined with technology and what ways art objects can do and reflect who we, are, who we want to be as a society. Can you share your thoughts about how design and different forms of human creation reflect our ideals? And what do, you, what do we do with all the contradictions? Well, actually, uh, you are probably asking too much to an artist. I guess when we are creating art, we are just trying to create a certain mirroring where you can reflect yourself. And then, honestly, I could tell you that it's a certain miracle when you can show your work to others. Or every public uh, commission, it's really a miracle. Uh, uh, and, and it's funny because when you are going deeper and deeper and, and this concept to share your work with others, uh, finally, you try to send messages as often as possible. I told, told her before to Emily, I guess, that idea that not to try to, to create, let's say, a certain strategy. Art for me is never a strategy. It's not uh, a, a, an idea to create a conflict. It's just to send a message. You can ask me, what is the message? Well, I'm still working because I'm trying to understand what is the message myself, I'm still on the road. And, uh, and this idea of intuition, many times I've been comparing my work to swimming in a black pool, in a, in a kind of dark water that uh, you don't know exactly in which direction are you moving and so suddenly you take your head out of the water to breathe. <gasps> and then it seems that everything is in order. But honestly, I don't know exactly how to explain why I'm doing art and what is the, my, my emotion when I'm in front of a piece talking about with other people. 
I guess art is a completely a miracle, honestly. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Kalala. Um, and now I'd like to um, invite Sophia Layton to, um, to ask her question. Hello, hello, Jamla. Good to see you. Um, my question is mostly for Tina, but I guess it could be directed to both of you. It's about how the location for the installation was determined. I'm just wondering if any other locations around the museum or even the university were considered. Um, if you could just maybe speak on speak on how that was determined, that would be great. I can begin and then um, Jean, I might have other things to add. Um, we considered one other location as well. And so when we were offered the gift um, by the Harrises, um, there were two possibilities on the campus. And one of them was by the Ruffin building, the new administration building kind of near where Washtana um, meets that building. And the other, of course, was in front of Uma, and we compared those two. And my feeling um, was that the site in front of the museum offered this incredible opportunity for people to approach the work, um, for people to really get close, and also the kind of crosshairs of that location. Um, and when Jama comes to Ann Arbor, he'll see this, but you know, the Diag is right there, State Street is right there. Um, so that part of the campus is just full of history um, and feeling and the past, and also just all of these bodies. I mean, the museum sees 250,000 people a year. So a lot of people um, walk by that intersection. So that felt very important to me, that there be um, a deep feeling of the, of the university's past and a lot of pedestrian traffic and also of course the entrance to the museum that that the work was introducing uh, and welcoming um, people to the museum and providing a kind of context for the for the art and the context of art within within it so I made the case um, for that being the, the preferable site and and I think that um, Jama agreed, but perhaps you want to say more. <laughs> Hi, Sophia. Hello. Uh, well, due to the global problem of the pandemic, I didn't visit the site before. Normally, it's the things that I like to do. Uh, but Tina sent me so beautiful renderings of the piece right near the door, the entrance of the museum, that I was completely fascinated. Uh, I don't know who did the renderings, but they look so real that I thought the piece was already installed when I got the first, the first drawings. And, uh, and they even decided, uh, the, the plinth that they uh, decided to use to install the piece on top. At that time, the piece, the, the last time I installed the piece was in Mexico City after New York. And, uh, and I guess it was a beautiful uh, place for that piece. Many times, when uh, I, I have a piece which is not exactly a commission, the piece becomes a kind of homeless, a kind of piece that is traveling all around, 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 waiting one day to find a, a permanently home. And, uh, and it was so beautiful for me to see that they decided to install the piece in that exactly corner, just besides the entrance, because I've been working for many years with doors doors as sculptures and uh, and the door for me is one of the most important parts of the building and i consider it an honor for me to be really in that place just to checking who is going in and out of the museum i, I think it was a terrific place if i may just make one comment um i think the hands kind of function as looking like doors and in a way they are That's they good. kind of work with that space um and so that, that's one observation that I had, but I, I too agree that it's it's a pretty wonderful place for it. And I, I'm glad that we can give it a home here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's beautifully said. Um, thank you, Angie and Emily, Kalala and Sophia for your wonderful questions. <laughs> well, on that note, I would like to thank you again for your time and your thought. Um, 
sharing so much with us today and to thank all the students for their really excellent questions. And of course, everybody, Christina and Lisa and others for making Nico and Paul Gray Gallery, um, your studio for making this conversation possible. Um, I have learned so much and I, I am just very, very, very honored to have talked to you. I hope we can really meet definitely soon and, uh, and, and, and finish that period of time so complex. And, yeah. <laughs> but thank you for that opportunity to share my ideas with you. Thank you very much. You too. Take care.